Hi everyone, my name is Danny Nirenberg. I'm president of Food Tank and I'm really thrilled to welcome you to Food Tank's webinar series. Thank you all for joining today's presentation. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that we'll be recording today's presentation and it will be available on foodtank.com uh, later this week. And we'll be taking questions via Twitter, but you can also email me directly at danielle at foodtank.com. Our, our speaker will talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll leave about 10 minutes for q and I'm really thrilled to introduce Dr. Jane Malin Cady, uh, who is with us today. She is the director of the international program at the McKnight Foundation, and she'll be talking about the need for farmer-centered research to create resilience in the food system. Jane joined McKnight in 2008 with extensive experience across the globe in evaluating and putting into practice sustainable agriculture projects. She has a PhD and an MA in Agricultural Education from the University of Minnesota. And I should also add that she's been a great friend and a great mentor to FUTIC. Jane, we're so honored you could be with us today. Thank you for joining us. The, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Danny, and thanks uh, folks that are on the webinar. It's, um, hopefully we'll have a good conversation today. Um, I'm really excited to be here on Food Tank and share some of the work of the McKnight Foundation's Collaborative Crop Research Program and some of our experiences with farmer-centered research. Uh, and Danny, everybody, you can hear me well, I'm assuming. Sounds Everything good? sounds great, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so the uh, as a good social scientist, I always want to start with what brings me here and uh, what are the sort of experiences that are informing what I'm talking about today. So very early on, I, I'm uh, the youngest of many children from a southern Minnesota farm family, and my father was a really innovative farmer and a very um, always experimenting with creating equipment that would create um, save more time and be more efficient for him. And he had one of the very first early cabs on his tractors that he made out of old windows from our farm. <laughs> and he also actually worked with a private sector firm to develop agricultural equipment. And it was really interesting for me to see how he did that and why he did that and what kind of benefits actually he reaped from that um, compared to what the private company reaped from it. But and then as I uh, went on to study uh, my and my postgraduate degrees, I really became interested in how were farmers engaged in smallholder agroecological development and research. And I was really inspired by an early read of Paolo Fideri's Pedagogy of the Oppressed that really puts you know, individuals in the driver's seat of their education and their work. And then when I came to the McKnight Foundation, I, uh, as part of the international program area, became the also direct director of the Collaborative Crop Research Program, a co-director with Rebecca Nelson out of Cornell University, a plant pathologist. And that program um, will really provide a deep basis for some of the points I'm going to share with you today. And so really I will be focusing mostly on that work, and which is a smallholder farmer focus. And interweaving that with some kind of high-level overviews of ag R&D systems that inform that work, sharing some opportunities and challenges that we've seen from that, and then I really do want to open up to hear from you all uh, about your questions and comments and experiences. So the McKnight Foundation, just to start there, it's a Minnesota family private family foundation that was started by one of the founders of 3M, which is a very innovative company that created post-it notes and sandpaper and adhesives and all kinds of um, innovative science and technology solutions. And that notion of innovation is really baked into the DNA of the foundation. In the early 1980s, the board of the foundation was deeply concerned about global hunger problems that were very much in the limelight at that time and decided to address the issue through the creation of a plant biology program. And that plant biology program really set the seed, so uh, the seeds were sown for the current CCRP. 
The CCRP, or the Collaborative Crop Research Program, works in 12 countries through a community of practice model, and there are three countries in each community of practice. Each of those communities of practice have a unique contextual focus based upon the needs of that region. So for example, in the Andes, we fund research that looks at Andean cropping systems. West Africa, you can see millet and sorghum-based systems and so on. At the heart of the research is, fi is um, you know, finding ecological solutions by, with, and for smallholder farmers. We also, the notion of linking local, regional, and global knowledge and practice is really important. And so I'll be talking a little bit how, what that looks like for us, as well as paying attention to what we're researching around ecological solutions and how that research is done. So the CCRP links local farmer knowledge of people in place with global knowledge of agroecology in order to, for multiple outcomes, you know, to improve nutrition, nutrition, livelihoods, productivity, equity for smallholder farmers in the four regions that include some of the hungriest on the planet. Through these local projects that, that we fund, farmers research and Researchers and development organizations collaborate on applied research to co-create locally appropriate solutions for identified smallholder farmer needs. And then these projects draw from a global evidence base on agroecology that provide principles and options to address these agro, the agro the agricultural, ecological, and social systems for farmers across this very broad range of socio-ecological contexts. So the findings and learnings from the local projects feed the growing body of knowledge about the AEI principles, options, and impacts in agroecological solutions. While these networks of farmers, researchers, and development organizations share these solutions that can be adapted around the world, they also inspire new solutions and improve smallholder farming in the regions and, and more broadly. So we link this through the, our program and we have regional teams that support these strategies and help facilitate information sharing and uh, local research that address these farmer needs. And we do this through a community practice model, as I said. And in that community practice, it's where we aim to create a space where collaboration among these different actors, the researchers, farmers, and development organizations, can spark insight, um, inspire innovation, and also collective action towards more ecological solutions. So the so within this context, I'm going to just share a very high level perspective on uh, how we grow food and create knowledge um, for agroecology. So the one can characterize the current dominant model approach as you know, of an industrial approach. It, it's a little more nuanced than that, but at a really high level, that's where a lot of the focus on agricultural research is. So in this kind of a model, researchers frequently overall set the agenda. The goal is to create really smart input-oriented solutions for farmers so they can adopt them. You know, examples in the classic example is hybrid seed and fertilizer. And typically there's a, a key priority, which is high productivity, very important. And oftentimes it's uniform environments where this is planted. So Southern Minnesota, you can look around and you see this alive and thriving. Uh, and it's within this kind of a, an approach that researchers are trained to generate solutions that are really important and productive. At the same time, we're also seeing some signs of distress and un unintended consequences in that system, right? So there's resource limits, which I'll expand on a little bit. There's health concerns, um, among other. And um, so there's been a lot of gains from this, but there are also problems that are emerging, and we're seeing those even more clearly now. Some of those included, you know, the our issue of greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss, loss of farmland, we're running out of land to farm and probably are over farming lands, water quantity and quality issues across the globe, and uh, soils are, are losing their fertility and their health. 
It's also important to note that in many parts of the world, this approach um, did not show up for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's in most, it's in these places, some of these places where the CCRP has been working since the early 2000s to promote more uh, productive local food systems without unintended negative consequences. So if we look at the places where this did not show up, you know, most of those are with smallholder farming systems. And these smallholder farming systems are under a lot of pressure right now. Uh, it's important to note that a third of the world's 7.3 billion people are smallholder farmers and their families, it's noted that they produce nearly 70% of all cons food consumed. And so they're a really key constituency. Um, and given that, their importance, but also given the challenges, which are political, social, biophysical, um, you can see some of them listed there. Uh, there's not a lot of agreement on what's the way forward to you know work with these very important constituents and also help deal some of these pressure problems. You know, some of the way forwards are more of a traditional approach, an ag transformation approach which basically says, you know, we'll get rid of the smallholders and we'll work with bigger, better, more modern farms. I'm oversimplifying, but, but it definitely is a perspective out there. There's a more of a green revolution where, well, let's bring better inputs to these smallholder farmers. They just need better inputs and, and all will be well. Then there is a, you know, step towards a little more, um, it's an ecological perspective where you look at a sustainable intensification model where it's about using those inputs more efficiently, using them better. And then we like to talk about an agroecological intensification model or a, a model where you're using more ecological solutions to address smallholder farmers' issues. And we often call say more of what we want with what we've got. Um, and so drilling down a little bit more we can compare this uh, more industrial approach to an agroecological approach. And this approach is where CCRP finds its unique place in, in ag R&D. So we see agri the agroecological approach as one of complementing other approaches at this time and talk more about that a bit shortly. But it's really important that in this approach, we recognize that local knowledge is used to complement the work of a broader community of researchers and other stakeholders, that diverse crop and ecological management practices aim to promote and prioritize multiple outcomes, including soil health, and that um, building resilient economies based on diverse and sustainable solutions are really important. And that we hope that the outcomes, you know, lead to, um, you know, better health for people and the planet, as well as sustainability or resilience and um, diversity, for example, is a, a more specific piece of that. So given this, that how we do the research needs to be different and what we focus on is important. These are the things that CCRP thinks about a lot to get to more farmer-centered approaches. There's a couple conceptual frameworks that also can help in the um, identification of what is important to research. One of those frameworks is was recently re released by the Independent, Independent Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems in June of 2016 and their report from uniformity to diversity. And what I like about this um, graphic is that it shows a trajectory or transition from where people are to something that is more diversified and ecological and resilient, right? And so uh, you'll see that in both of the trajectories of subsistence agriculture and industrial agriculture, the first step is building knowledge. And that's a place that um, we sit in CCRP is trying to, again, address what are we doing and how are we, how are we doing that research. Another model that is likely embedded and informed that last one is Gleesman's agroecological conversion or transition levels. And what I like about this is that it really is a practical um, way to show what are some of the, to, to guide sort of research choice and priority. Of course, including farmers' perspective in that. But some, you know, it starts with um, becoming, 
um, more efficient in conventional practices, but then substituting with more ecological practices. Redesigning systems is phase three. And then also in, in level four, thinking about those connections between farmers and eaters. And that's something I know that Food Tank is really great at talking about and sharing with others and inspiring others to think about. Uh, and CCRP, we've been able to support research that addresses really level one through four. And I think a, a place where we're trying to also engage is level five through some of our um, collaborations that we're part of. So as noted in an agroecological approach, functional diversity is really key. And so the diversity of available, that, you know, it's, it's often agreed upon that the diversity of available crops can lead to more diverse diets and that leads to better nutrition. So in the CCRP program, since the early 2000s, we've been funding crop improvement work along with seed systems and biodiversity work to support access to and use of diverse and locally important crops. In the early 2000s, you know, the term orphan crops was used, but there wasn't uh, a lot of research funding going to valuing those systems and helping address issues in those systems. So some of the crops that we've supported over time are these small seeded, highly nutritious and resilient grains like teff in Ethiopia, finger millet and sorghum in East Africa, pearl millet and sorghum in West Africa, quinoa and amaranth in the Andes, and so on. We also have been funding work in uh, nitrogen fixing protein rich legumes like cowpea, common bean, bambara groundnut, and lupin. Uh, some of that work with the legumes really is important too because it leads to building a more uh, healthy, building a healthier soil, right, which is a key to a productive and resilient system. And, you know, common approaches in many places, if you look at either um, more the more dominant approaches to the way we grow food is really about let's find a good fertilizer to use and you know really since the 2000s there's been a lot more recognition of the fact that legumes play a key role in using um, nitrogen uh, contributing nitrogen to the soil as well as providing uh, food for people to eat leaves for people to eat improving human health and also as fodder for animals and so there's, here you see in this photo example of um, a variety of legumes that we have been supporting and actually use, we found in a marketplace in Africa. More specifically, it's also really important that we see lots of opportunity around biological inputs for more research, right? And this is important not only for, um, the for managing uh, crop for crop management issues, but as well as storing grain and so on, and as uh, fertilizer, right? And so we've been providing a lot of research support for botanical pesticides and uh, bio inputs such as human urine and animal urine. And in fact, that that research that we've done was led by farmers, and we've had, had some amazing results from that work. Another important thing to remember and remind ourselves is that, you know, while yield is important, it's not always the first consideration. It's a very important consideration. But, you know, there are times when it's important to look at how do you support seeds, for example, to be more resilient within untired soils, right? In Africa, there's a lot of phosphorus deficient soils. And so we've been supporting crop breeding to improve root hair systems that can actually um, perform well in those kind of soils. So I shared with, I just shared with you a few of the examples of what we, what could be researched um, around agroecological agro approaches. And for us, it's really important to look also at the how of how do we really reach towards more farmer-centered approaches. It's really critical in doing that kind of research that those engaged value different knowledge systems and they understand how to interact with 
folks that are different than them, right? And so the key three constituents that we tend to fund are farmers, NGOs, and formally trained scientists. And it's not always a given that people know how to work together. So I just want to give an example of one of a longtime grant recipient of the CCRP from Bolivia, Dr. Alejandro Bonifacio, and some of you may know of him. He is an Aymara Indian, uh, which is an indigenous group of the Andes, and the CCRP has been supporting his work both by helping him complete his PhD studies as well as his plant breeding work with the Proimpa Foundation in Bolivia since the late 1990s. He has many accomplishments, they're very highly regarded, and we have been able to support some of some of his work getting there, but it's really him that's that's is the reason for the success. He was a key person in saving quinoa germplasm of thousands of native land races when the National Ag Research Center was in crisis and was um, basically changing hands and shut down. Um, he was also, he's been a principal breeder of five varieties of quinoa and co-breeder on another eight varieties. He's won an Inter-American Agricultural Award for his, in 2009 for all of these accomplishments and he's a professor emeritus of Universi Universidad Mayor San Andres. He was made that in 2012. And he's also supervised over 50 undergrad theses and eight graduate level the theses. And so what CCRP has been able to do is help um, complement his amazing local knowledge with the scientific knowledge and give him the space and the time to do that. He's collected germplasm from all over Bolivia. He's developed these varieties that are valued by many, many farmers. And he is an inspiration to new generations of Bolivian agronomists. And we did not help Alejandro understand the needs of farmers or know how to work with farmers. That is who he is. And it is that kind of expertise and experience that needs to be supported so that incredible work like this can happen. That various knowledge systems can be integrated and those kind of results will show. His worldview is steeped in the valuing of biodiversity and he's he's been a great leader to the Andean community of practice and to fellow breeders in Ecuador and so on. And so Alejandro to us is the kind of person that really is going to help these farmer-centered approaches towards more agroecological solutions. Another example that I can share is the example of Fumagasquia, which is a farmer organization. And they've been a leader in West Africa, um, helping set research priorities that really address their interests around productivity, equity, and sustainability. So this organization, Fumagasquia, has over 12,000 members in Niger, where, as you know, it's a really, um, it's a challenging place where individuals and families do not really have consistent food access throughout the year. There's low crop yields, inconsistent rains, there's limitations of transportation, and um, all you know under the gut, under in being influenced by extreme climate change at the moment. Women and children are often the most vulnerable during these periods of hunger. And women's fields, for example, the yields are often lower than in men's fields because they have limited time for farming activities and they often have been left out of um, development processes such as research and knowledge sharing. So CCRP in 2009, I believe, awarded our first grant to a farmer organization and it was Fumagaskia. Uh, there was resistance from researchers who really did not want to work with farmers being the project leaders. But Fumagaskia persisted. They led a research project on increasing productivity in women's fields, um, again, including in using um, locally available and easily accessible resources, wood, ash, and urine being two of those. And initial results are promising, very promising. They've grown from a successful partner, the organization itself, in a participatory research project. So they were in a project before they became a leader to a leader of ag R&D projects. And women are setting the research priorities and objectives and are analyzing the results. And they're getting the support they need from local and international re formally trained researchers. And now um, that collaboration across sector has been 
very welcomed by all, which is which is an exciting shift to see. And so this project really underscores the potential of farmer networks to generate, you know, relevant, applicable research, engage farmers in co-creating new knowledge, and even marginalize farmers in doing that, and ultimately to build sort of farmer agency and research skills to improve agroecological practices and rural livelihoods. A final example that I'd like to give from CCRP is the uh, key priority area of ours, which is farmer research networks, which are basically a collection of farmer groups networked together that engage in research uh, with other researchers, formerly trained researchers and NGOs. And this is really important because farmers, uh, as I said earlier, smallholder farmers play a key role in global food security. And that's increasingly being recognized. Yet at the same time, traditional research needs have not really met uh, the met their needs, right? Uh, so also I do want to recognize that over the past 50 years, there's really been a gradual shift in the role of farmers from being passive recipients to active participants in research intended for their benefit. And participatory researchers and you know those commitments have are are there in many places. Yet I think it's time to take a step forward, and we we see the potential of FRNs to further strengthen that and move that forward. The because far, smallholder farmer needs are so heterogeneity, there there's so much heterogeneity that smallholder farmers are really only partially served by a more one-size-fits-all approach that we see kind of as a priority in ag R&D. And so we see that FRNs can help scale successful experiences and institutional arrangements. They can uh, you know, help solve real research problems that are relevant for them. They can ensure more equitable access to agricultural innovations, and they can build more effective feedback and accountability systems with all actors involved. And finally, we, we see that effective FRNs can also support rural vibrancy and agency of farmers, farmer organizations, and their communities. And so we, uh, for us, farmer research network, networks really have the potential to amplify the impact of farmer-centered innovation systems. And so all of these three examples, I think it's just important to note that it's that it's up to all of us to, and you know wherever we sit in this puzzle to build the next generation of agroecological research leaders. And that means scientists that can interact with farmers and NGOs and do systems oriented research, which is, you know, it is more challenging in ag research to um, consider multiple vari variables as opposed to one or two or even three. And it's that kind of thing that uh, will be necessary as well as paying attention to power relationships, paying attention to how one can work collaborative collaboratively across sector to address uh, uh, solutions, identify research opportunities and so forth. And so not only is that important for formally trained researchers, but it's also the, also important for farmers to feel um, the agency that they need to engage and the respect as well as NGOs. And so we think that we can play a small part in doing that and we look forward to collaborating with others uh, to do that better. So finally, I just want to highlight a few successes. There are many. I, I'm really excited about the growing recognition of the importance of farmer-centered research and ecologically oriented research. We have the FAO providing great leadership in agroecology. And if there is, um, they've recently launched an agroecology knowledge hub, which has uh, great information up there around 10 elements of agroecology. It's a really thoughtful website. I highly encourage people to go there. They're also launching a journal, an online journal called Elementa that will be uh, highlighting each of these elements. And what's exciting about that is that they will have uh, scientific, you know, peer-reviewed re results in there. They also will have policy briefs and they'll have 
uh, information for farmers in there as well, practical information. And so they're doing some really important work and providing great leadership there. There is Food Tank and, and the, the network of Food Tank people that are really making a difference in how we think about how we create new knowledge as well as for what and about what. Uh, consumer demand for healthy food is driving this. The sustainable development goals, I think, are a really important success in that the recognition that we all have a part in reaching true sustainability is at the core of that. And I think that if we, as again, where we all sit, can start thinking about what is our contribution to moving towards those sustainable development goals, that can be a really uh, important target for us. There's a, so much great work by NGOs out there. You got Groundswell International, you have Via Campesina, you have Via Campesina Universities, uh, you have you know, NGOs from all over the globe providing great leadership on how we can move towards more farmer-centered approaches that will lead us to more resilience in our world. We have uh, funders groups like Global Alliance and the Agroecology Fund that are really trying to support that, among others. At the same time, there's a lot to celebrate. There's, again, challenges. That's normal. There's tensions out there. What's the way forward in agriculture? How are we going to do our research? Uh, I think that's, you know, that's that's been a tension that's been there <laughs> for quite some time, but I do see that there's more space for conversation about that. I do see um, that, you know, when we talk about agroecology, it's often referred to as a science practice and movement. And uh, in the places that I go and the work that CCRP does, I see sometimes a siloization between science practice and movement towards agroecology. Not always, but it is there to a degree. And I think that the more that we can build bridges to understand each other between uh, those, the science practice and movement folks, I think that's going to propel forward more ecological solutions and more resilience. And then of course threats. Uh, science itself and the media are under threat. That's going to impact this kind of work, but um, we, you know, and not only this work, but it's impacting many other places as well. We have the climate change acceleration and sort of instability across the globe in, in every place. And so those are threats that also will and do influence uh, the kind of work that we do. And so on that note, I'm going to stop and open it up for any kind of questions and comments. And I think, Danny, you'll take the lead here on that. And thank you yeah. all for letting me share some of my story and some of my experience. And hopefully you found it um, interesting and helpful. Thank you so much, Jane. That was a really great and informative and exciting presentation. I, I, we have had a ton of questions come in. Um, given your schedule today, I, I think we'll just take about 10 minutes to go through a few of these. And if people want to follow up, I'll put together a list of, of the questions and email them to you. And if we can post something on Food Tank later on to help people understand um, more, then, then we can do that. Um, That'd be great, the, yeah. The, the first question is kind of an obvious one. And given that, that you know the McKnight Foundation has been sort of the leader on this, why aren't other foundations and donors doing more of this work? I know there's some, but can you talk about sort of why the big foundations, in your opinion, haven't taken on this, this participatory, you know, community of practice uh, uh, research in, into their projects? Well, I think that there's a spectrum out there of, of folks doing this, right? And so, as I said, there, I, there are, um, I see a growing conversation around it. I see hope around this. I also see challenge, right? Um, and so from my perspective, you can look at funder collaboratives like the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, which has a diverse group of foundations in there that are small, medium, and large, European, North American, growing in the Global South membership slowly, that Within that group, for example, you see traditional conservation funders, and even outside that group, you see traditional conversation funders entering the, the space to, 
to recognize that the way in which we grow food is really important to impacting biodiversity that they care about, right? And so that is, even at the IUCN meeting last year, Ruth Richardson, who's executive director of the Global Alliance, was able to, was asked on the last day to give a, a keynote on the importance of agricultural biodiversity and the way we grow food in relation to biodiversity. And so you see some of those funders starting to think more broadly about root causes, I would say. You see uh, small and medium-sized funders banding together to try and promote agroecological solutions through the Agroecology Fund, which was started three or four years ago and has grown and is growing with funders that are part of that. And there is a, there is a deep interest in that group of funders wanting to uh, support this more horizontal co-creation of knowledge that I talked about today. So that's very exciting. I think that uh, there was a recent, well, I think that some of the reason why uh, other funders might not be here yet, <laughs> I think really goes back to the, the slide that talked about what's the solution for smallholder farmers. I could go there, but I, I don't want to get people dizzy, right? And so there isn't an, a total agreement that is it about sustainable intensification? Is it about a new green revolution? Is it about, you know, traditional agricultural transformation, link, which links to those two? What is the solution? And I think with just the more that we can use research to create an evidence base for not only how to do agroecological work, but what are the impacts of that work? I think uh, that paying attention to impacts and outcomes will hopefully make an influence on some of the other funders. But I do see more of an openness to talk about it, and I have seen it grown a lot in the last nine years. That, that's fantastic. That's really hopeful. Um, you know, you, at the beginning of your, your talk, you, you talked about your, your, your dad's work with the private sector. What do you think the private sector's role in, in the collaborative crop research program in the future might be? Yeah, we actually think a lot about that and I, I, our answers are slowly revealing themselves. I mean, we've worked in, a, in, a, in small ways with the private sector. Uh, and for example, we funded a project that involved uh, ICRASAT, a Minnesota-based nonprofit and called Compatible Technologies Inc. International and Farmers that identified um, farmer needs to address some labor, to create labor saving devices around groundnut management and processing. And so that first step was prototyping, working together. And then the next step is the, the prototype itself local private sector manufacturers are going to take that and make it available in affordable ways to farmers, right? So there's, how do you work? I would say that the private sector being engaged with more of a, an equity oriented lens is where we would like to work like social entrepreneurship. I think that's important. I also, you know, farmers themselves are private sector folks, right? They, they're producers. And I think that uh, consumers and consumer choice and, and consumer demand can really influence kind of what our, what the private sector is going to do or what farmers will grow. Uh, and so again, most of our work has, has, is just starting to move into that private sector space, um, but again, around more equitable approaches to private sector efforts. That, that's great. And it's great that, you know, the private sector is interested in doing that sort of thing, because I think for so long, they sort of shunned that. Um, you know, I, I think we'll just have one more question. And this is, is a good one from one of our, our listeners. Um, you talked about the women's group in, in Niger and, and the important role that they played uh, as part of the CCRP. Can you talk about some of the obstacles they faced as a women's group? You said that they were able to get buy-in from, from the local community, but that must have been difficult. Can you, do you have any stories to share? Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Well, I, you know, the best people to talk about it are, are the folks, our team in, in West Africa, but I can do my best to share some of the stories that I've heard. And I think that the, the for, hang on one second, the, the, the Fumagaskia has really been supported strongly by um, the, our regional representative and liaison scientist, our, our team that works in the region. One of those individuals, Bettina Hussman, is a plant breeder and before she started collaborating with CCRP as a team member, she was a grantee. And so she herself has had a strong commitment to helping women play more leadership roles and having their needs met um, and having their voice be part of identifying what those needs are. And so you'll see that in some of the examples I gave when I told the story was, you know, that women's fields are typically, uh, have the least bit amount of resources, knowledge, finances, et cetera, going towards them. And because there was openness and interest to a commitment to more equity oriented approaches around gender, the farmer, the, the farmers themselves, there was a place for them to grow into that. And not only was that um, Bettina's role, but the leader of Fumagaskia, Aminu, what is also open to that as well. And so, you know, I can probably find more detailed examples. There's actually been some case studies of Fumagaskia or journal articles that I, I could even make available that would tell those stories probably in a little bit more detail. That would be that. Yeah, that would be fantastic and we can post them on foodtank.com and, and share them with folks and, and maybe do a write-up and some interviews uh, with, with some of those folks. That would be amazing. Uh, Jane, I, I want to be aware of your time. There are a lot more questions, but I, I want to let you get back to uh, the important work that you do. We will share the questions with you and um, make them available on the website as well. Thank you so much. It was really great to hear all of this amazing work that's being done. and. And we hope you'll uh, reach out if you want to share further thoughts uh, later this year or next year. Sure, that'd be great. And any questions I can answer, like you said, um, online, I'll be happy to do so. I, I, I'd love to hear what people are thinking. So, Fantastic. Thanks to all of those uh, of you who have been listening. Uh, we'll make this available again on our website, foodtank.com, uh, later this week. Thank you all again. Bye.